again, I think. Um, thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, this has been uh, a long time in the making uh, for me. I, uh, to see Steve be able to produce this book uh, after basically five years, uh, a lot of research went into this book. It's, I thought what, we, what I'd do tonight is just, I, I read the book and uh, Steve and I worked on probably a dozen stories for Planned Philly about the SS United States. Um, they are mere outlines of, of the book. Uh, the book goes into, does such thorough research that what I thought would be fun tonight would be to talk about some of the things that surprised me. Uh, what I thought would be fun tonight is to talk about some of the things that surprised me when I read the book. Um, but first, Steve, uh, bring everyone a little bit up to speed on the conservancy efforts because, I mean, there is a timeline issue here uh, in terms of where the boat stands in, ter in terms of viability and the future. Well, the uh, current status uh, with the ship right now is she's owned by the SS United States Conservancy, which is a nonprofit formed in 2004 that was meant to raise awareness uh, of the plight of the ship. And in 2010, the ship was put up for sale by her then current owner, uh, Norwegian Cruise Lines. They had originally thought about redoing the ship as a modern cruise vessel. And then because of the economic situation, they decided to pull the plug on the project and she was put on the scrap market and everyone thought this is it, the SS United States after evading the scrappers for decades, this is finally it. Well, the day before all scrapping bids were due, Jerry Lenfest called the Conservancy Line and one of our board members who was a crew member on the ship picked up and he couldn't believe what he heard. Uh, my name is Jerry Lenfest, how much is it to buy the ship? And uh, he, <laughs> Joe wasn't really sure, it was, he wasn't sure this was real, but. It turned out Jerry um, had a keen interest in the ship, uh, namely because he was a naval officer and his uh, father helped design portions of the ship. His father was a naval architect. Uh, he designed the watertight doors and some of the bridge equipment. So the ship was purchased from Norwegian Cruise Lines in February of 2011. And the Conservancy is now charged with uh, redeveloping the ship as a stationary attraction. Uh, the analogy I like to make is that imagine that a divine intervention like this had happened in the early 60s when Penn Station was about to get torn down. We look at that today and we think, how could they have torn down Pennsylvania Station? Then we look at what's in Pennsylvania Station's place, that ugly uh, rabbit warren of a place. Uh, this is an unbelievable opportunity. But Jerry Lenfest has provided the Conservancy with 20 months of funding after time of purchase to maintain the ship. And if there is not a clear development plan, a real estate deal, and the American public doesn't rally behind this project, then the SS United States will be sold and towed to a Gulf Coast beach and sliced into scrap metal. And that would be a very painful image, I'm sure. I mean, many of you, I'm sure, have seen images of Pennsylvania Station getting torn down. That's what will happen with the ship. Um, the the SS United States has been on our waterfront since 1996. I was one of the many, many people who passed that ship going over to Whitman, uh, just driving up Delaware Avenue. Didn't really think about it too much. I mean, I was, I was struck by her. I was struck by the fact that she looked fast standing still, but I really didn't realize anything about her legacy or linkage to Philadelphia. And let's tell us a little bit about her architect, William Francis Gibbs and how the boat connects to our history. Well, uh, we have a very, um, we're lucky tonight to be on the Delaware River and have a view of the SS United States on the Delaware River because in many ways that's where the ship was born. In 1894, an eight-year-old boy named William Francis Gibbs who grew up on North Broad Street and Rittenhouse Square stood by his father's side at Cramp Shipyards, now, which is famous, long since closed, and saw an ocean liner called the St. Louis roar down the ways. Uh, with to the cheering of crowds, the ship was draped in red, white, and blue bunting. And William Francis Gibbs always said, from that moment on, when I saw that ship launched, I knew what I wanted to do with my life. And he uh, pursued that passion um, until he achieved his goal of designing his own ocean liner. Uh, Gibbs was born in Philadelphia in 1886. His father was a very wealthy financier who was connected with the Wideners. 
And after leaving North Broad Street, the family moved to a big mansion on Rittenhouse Square. And Gibbs was a very shy child, um, spent most of his time tinkering and doodling in his family's house. His father wanted him to be a lawyer because he felt that being a naval architect was not a stable profession. Well, his senior year at Harvard, calamity happens when the family uh, has a severe economic uh, reversal. They lose their mansion, and Gibbs is forced to drop out. And he basically said, if it wasn't for the fact my father had, if my father had not gone bankrupt, I would not have had the drive that I have today to remake myself. So he ended up working his way through Columbia to get his BA, and then got his law degree. Uh, practiced law for one year, hated it, and eventually apprenticed himself to a famous admiral who saw that this kid had talent, an admiral called David Taylor. And Taylor taught him what he needed to learn. And Gibbs eventually moved to New York and started a very successful practice, uh, not just designing passenger ships, but also uh, naval ships. He designed 70% of all uh, naval vessels built during World War II, which is an incredible achievement. Destroyers, cruisers, he designed the Normandy landing craft. He was also the man responsible for the Liberty ship, the iconic Liberty ship, which was the mass-produced uh, cargo ship that helped win the war. Basically, build ships faster than the Germans can sink them. That was basically the uh, way to build his mindset. But he, even throughout his, this very successful career, he still remained focused on the grand prize, building his thousand-foot-long ship. And what really irritated him was that the European governments subsidized their shipping companies with vast amounts of money to build bigger, faster passenger ships, ships that were not only to be luxurious, but also uh, had enough engine power to outdo the previous record holder. And this is a time when the blue riband of the Atlantic, the highest average speed across the Atlantic, really meant something. And so that was Gibbs' obsession to build an American version. Tell the uh, folks gathered here a little bit about, we, we know that he could make a lot of ships. We knew he had an obsession with the United States. Talk about his innovation, though, because on a lot of levels, he was doing things other naval, naval architects weren't doing, even though he was self-taught. Well, uh, he actually credited, when people asked him, you know, why are you so innovative, he said, well, I, didn't, I wasn't formally trained. I learned how to think outside the box. And with his destroyers they built in the 1930s, he used a revolutionary new engine, high pressure, um, high temperature steam, which allowed these destroyers that he built to basically run circles around not only previous destroyers, but around the British and the Japanese destroyers as well. And uh, he worked in a lot of these innovations that had been made during the crucible of World War II into the SS United States. Uh, what makes the SS United States so special compared to other passenger ships like the Queen Mary uh, or the Bremen or the Europa or some of the other great Europeans before. First of all, she had the greatest power to weight ratio of any commercial vessel in history and she was only outclassed in that regard by a few naval vessels. Uh, she had a steel hull, a very well-made steel hull made of Luke and steel uh, right here in Pennsylvania. And the superstructure was not steel but aluminum. She was the largest use of aluminum up to that time. So everything above the promenade deck, the upper deck, the funnels, and some of the decking up, up top was aluminum. So that allowed the ship to save a tremendous amount of weight. Uh, the engines were basically were high, high temperature, high pressure turbines, which were later used in the Forrestal uh, class aircraft carrier. So she was just an incredibly powerful vessel, built for speed. She in many ways, the way I like to sum her up is she combined the speed and maneuverability of a destroyer with the luxury and space of an ocean liner, something that had never been done before. Talk a little bit more about her speed, just in terms of like sea trials and the, I, the fact that um, so much was classified and why did that happen with this boat? Well, William Francis Gibbs was kind of like Steve Jobs in that he was terrified of other people stealing his ideas. And uh, he was also, like Jobs, a very good project manager. He was sort of the big picture guy who said, I want a ship to look like this. I want it to be beautiful. I want it to have these specifications. And then he would work with his engineers and basically pester them all the way through the process to make sure they fulfilled his vision and the ship looked the way he wanted it to look. But the ship was uh, classified. A lot of her design specs were classified because 
two thirds of her $78 million cost was subsidized by the US government. Uh, 